Deadlands is a Weird West RPG setting by Shane Lacey Hensley of Pinnacle Entertainment Group, originally published in 1996. A second edition came out in 1999, and then another edition called Deadlands Reloaded in 2006. The setting itself has picked up no fewer than eight origin awards at this point, and has been adapted to a number of tabletop RPG rule sets, including GURPS, the D20 system, and the version I'm taking a look at in this video, Savage Worlds Adventure Edition, or Suede. I guess my big question is, does Deadlands live up to the hype as a Weird West setting? I decided to focus on the Suede version of the setting because it seemed like the newest iteration, and Suede is a game that I do play from time to time. If you're not familiar with Savage Worlds Adventure Edition, check out my quick primer on the core rulebook, I'll link it below. The Suede version of Deadlands was written by Shane Lacey Hensley and Matthew Cutter and published in 2020. Just like with most Suede supplements, you'll still need the core rulebook to play this. The supplement, which runs 200 pages, does not contain any of the core Suede rules. One interesting thing I want to mention about Suede Deadlands is that there are at this point a fair number of expansions to the setting itself, keyed to this rule set. In this video, I'm going to unbox two of these products, the box set for Horror at Headstone Hill and the official Deadlands Suede Standees. I'll be presenting the Headstone Hill scenario with spoilers, but I'll put that segment at the very end and make it clear in the video when that will start so you can avoid spoilers if you want. As for spoilers regarding the meta plot of the setting of Deadlands itself, I'm just going to start throwing those at you right off the bat. But first, let's take a look at the sponsor for this video. This video is sponsored by Che Peku, creators of battle maps for role-playing games. They are now on a dedicated new Patreon, making maps of all shapes and sizes for sci-fi and cyberpunk games that include spaceships, space stations, cities, alien worlds, vehicles, mechs, and more. Their maps work in every virtual tabletop, including Roll20, Foundry, Alchemy, you name it. For their mechs and spaceships, they make both the interiors and exteriors to maximize play options, either for onboard action or full-on mech and space battles. Their Patreon is producing three or four sci-fi battle maps a month right now, and as a patron, you get to vote on what you'd like them to create. Each map that they make comes with a ton of variations, usually about 10 variants per map, so you can get an exact fit for any given scene that you're trying to run. They recommend the $5 tier on their Patreon, which gives you access to all previously released maps and all variations. At the $10 level, you also get animated maps and Foundry VTT modules. They've been making battle maps for four years running now, and their Fantasy Battle Maps Patreon has over 18,000 patrons at this point. The requests for them to make sci-fi and cyberpunk maps was so overwhelming that they've launched a whole new Patreon account that caters exclusively to those genres. I can personally attest to their quality of fantasy maps since I've been using them for years. I can't wait to use some of their sci-fi maps in my upcoming games. I've left a link to where you can find their new sci-fi battle maps Patreon down below. Alright, back to the video. The previous versions of Deadlands through the years each have the same storyline overall, but each one starts you in a different year. The first edition started you in 1876, then the second edition started you in 1877. In this edition, you start in 1884, and basically, the story goes like this. During the Civil War, which in our timeline lasted from 1861 to 1865, a Native American shaman opened a gate to another dimension and unleashed what could be described as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, death, famine, war, and conquest. These demonic entities are referred to as the Reckoners in the setting. They became focused on reconditioning Earth into a hellscape so that they could enter our plane and take over completely. In order to do so, they did a couple of things. One, create monsters, beasts, and ghosts based on everyone's worst fears in order to create as much fear and distrust as possible. And two, cause an earthquake in California that sinks half the state into the Pacific Ocean, exposing a soul-infused stone that they implanted there called Ghost Rock. Ghost Rock burns five times hotter than coal, and due to that fact, it changed the course of the Civil War making things drag out as the South built up steampunk-like war machines and gave the North a run for its money. The war didn't end until 1871 in this setting, and due to the huge number of divergences from our own timeline, the continent is divided into multiple autonomous regions, including an independent Utah, independent Native American territory, and semi-autonomous city-states. Probably most importantly for you as a GM or player is the fact that everything in the continental U.S. west of the Mississippi River is a horror-infested, weird, wild west. 
and it's your mission to defeat fear, instill hope, and push back the forces of those reckoners who want to reform the land into a hellscape. And you do that by killing one nasty, hellacious critter at a time. One of the coolest features of the Deadlands setting is the character types that you choose from. The archetypes are Blessed, Bounty Hunter, Chi Master, Common Folk, Deserter, Drifter, Escort, Explorer, Grifter, Huckster, which is actually sort of like a Weird West Sorcerer, Immigrant, Indian Shaman, Indian Warrior, Law Dog, Mad Scientist, Muck Raker, which is a journalist in case you were wondering, Outlaw, and Prospector. Just like with any Sway character, you choose your hindrances with a point by, then attributes, skills, and edges. There are 10 new hindrances that the setting provides. Some feel pretty generic like Aelin, which is just a chronic illness. Although if you're leaning into the setting, you can recharacterize that as something thematic. A much more intrinsically thematic hindrance is Old Ways Oath, where your character has pledged to forego modern technology to honor the nature spirits. There's a tension in the setting between technology, especially that fueled by ghost rock, and the natural order. It especially shows up in the native territories where manufactured technology tends to fail and break down completely. There are about 30 new edges in the setting on top of the default ones you'll find in the suede core rules. Some of these edges are simply required if you want to be a certain character type. Arcane background huckster, for example, is a prerequisite for making a huckster character. Notice that there are attribute minimums for some of these edges. One other thing about these edges is that you can't access a lot of them when you start up a character at novice level. So if you're just playing a one shot with a novice, you won't get to enjoy a lot of these edges that only trigger deeper into a character's development. The most obvious example of this is the set of legendary edges here, which afford some crazy features. Damned is an interesting one. In the game, there's always a chance that you could return as an undead called a harrowed. But with the Damned Edge, your character is guaranteed to return as a Harrowed. Your body is just constantly rotting as a Harrowed, and you have to drink a ton of alcohol each day to keep your insides pickled, and hide your open death wounds so that you don't freak people out. The most interesting thing about the gear section is how cheap everything is. Or at least it seems cheap. That's what 140 years of inflation will do for you. If you're into old school American firearms, you'll love the minutiae provided in this setting. Even though a Colt Buntline Special and a Colt Peacemaker both fire 45 caliber bullets and do the same damage, one is 15 bucks and one is 500 bucks with a 16 inch barrel and special order only. Lots of fun like that if you want to get into it. The most important bit in this section is Infernal Devices. These are the weapons powered by Ghost Rock Powder, which burns super hot. Ghost Rock is really important because it's the conduit that Deadlands uses to inhabit the steampunk space in terms of theme. The first example of this is right here, where if you want to rush delivery on some infernal device that you've ordered from one of the bigger manufacturers, they will dispatch an auto gyro for $1,000 and fly it out to you anywhere within 50 miles of a major city. I don't know what an auto gyro is exactly, but I pretty much picture a steampunk contraption powered by Ghost Rock, of course. But here you go. Check out all these steampunk devices that exist in the setting. You can't have Weird West without spring boots and an electrostatic belt. In terms of the price, infernal devices get so expensive that they're really something that the GM is going to have to provide to you in the narrative. Either that or your posse is going to have to rob a money train or something. One important detail to keep in mind both as a GM and player is the overall contours of criminal law in any given town or city. The hope is that your character is at least given due process if they get jammed up with the authorities because sentencing is harsh in the Wild West. There are just a few special game rules that come with the setting, one of the most important ones being dueling. Duels are structured as lasting for three rounds, and I won't get into the specifics, but everyone involved draws whole cards and action cards and resolves them according to these special rules. I appreciate this little mini game because it's just very thematic in terms of the setting being the Wild West and all that. Equally thematic is the specific mechanic for when your character is being hanged from the neck with a rope. If you're hanged, you have to make a negative four vigor roll, a failure of which means your character is cooked. If your vigor roll succeeds, you have to make a negative six vigor roll each minute or suffer a level of fatigue until you either die or get rescued. Stampedes are also spot on in terms of relevant setting mechanics. Circling back to the character types, Several of the types come with a lot of unique options. For agents, you belong to a federal administration called the Special Services Agency, or Agency, 
with jurisdiction in all 37 states. You can think of them as the 1884 men in black. They have their own special ranks, going from zero to six, with players probably just exploring up to grade three. The most important thing about ranks, besides your weekly salary, is that you get a certain number of favors, which are requests for an agency field office. This can range from gear to weapons to key information about some investigation. Here's some examples along with their favor value. Chi Master, which I naturally find the most offensive in the setting, require the martial artist edge. Aside from them being perpetually depicted as mystical Chinese people, I actually like the underlying concept of people from another land fighting for human rights and dignity, seeking to bring order to chaos. The edges for a Chi Master track all of your foundational Kung Fu styles, at least in pop culture. Drunken style, eagle, mantis, monkey, and a few others. It's important to keep in mind that your character doesn't have to be a stereotypical Chinese person to be a Chi Master. Anyone can learn from a Sifu or a teacher and learn the ways of what is essentially magical Kung Fu. The harrowed type is an important one in this setting because as mentioned before, it's playable undead. This bit is pretty important here. When a hero dies, the action deck is shuffled and deals one card for each of the PC's ranks. If any come up as a joker, then the character returns as a harrowed. There are a lot of fun little features when playing as a living corpse in Deadlands, including the fact that you have to constantly drink alcohol to keep your insides from rotting. You can let the devil out and add D6s to all trait and damage rolls for five rounds, but take on the risk of something from this Dominion table, but you only have to sleep 1d6 hours a day. You also get access to 12 new edges, all of them pretty ghoulish in nature, but powerful. Hellfire, for example, is fire that you could shoot from your fingertips. Infest allows you to summon all nearby bugs and creepy crawlies. Wither gives you the power to accelerate the aging of your victim with a touch. Hucksters are another major character type in my opinion because they are the sorcerers or wizards of the setting. There's a whole system called dealing with the devil where instead of casting a spell normally, they can draw a card in order to cast any spell in their available powers list, even those they don't know or have rank for. The dealing with the devil cast comes with a special table that you have to refer to every time you do this, and you run the risk of failure on the casting roll, which triggers a roll on the backfire table. All this is fun, but it does run the risk of hogging a lot of spotlight at the table. Out of the four special huckster edges, I was particularly tickled by Watley blood, where your character shares a blood relation to the infamous Watleys. This of course is an homage to one of H.P. Lovecraft's greatest stories, the Dunwich Horror. The book also goes into detail on mad scientists, shamans, and rangers, which all have their own ranks and special little rules and fun edges. As a GM or marshal, the big overarching countdown is the fear level, which measures how close the Reckoners are to making Earth a living hell and thereby entering and consuming everything in the world. That level ranges from zero to six, with a penalty on all fear checks in the game if the level is anywhere from three to six. The way to beat back the fear as a posse of PCs is to defeat a local threat and then make an oration or storytelling check where you retell the story of your heroic deed to the local population. Here's a decent summary of what each fear level looks like in the world at large. There is a lot of support in the book for GMs trying to come up with encounters and adventures. Tables for objectives, obstacles, and complications can be generated with a deck of cards pretty quickly, or at the very least, you can get inspired by these tables. Encounter tables use a D20 or D12, and these are broken down by region. These creatures mentioned here are all statted at the end of the book. Even though in this video, I pretty much spoiled the major elements of the setting, with the Reckoners being the four horsemen of the apocalypse who implanted Ghost Rock into the earth and Ghost Rock being infused with the damned souls, the setting gets a lot more detailed. And I think that's one of the major appeals of this setting. This section of the book goes on for dozens of pages and provides roughly a hundred different locations, each acting as an adventure hook. I wouldn't say that most of these location descriptions give you everything you need to run a session, but you're going to get a nice launching point when trying to come up with an overall conflict. One huge element of the setting is the Great Rail Wars, which you can think of as a conflict between supernaturally managed railway companies for dominance 
of territory across the continental US and the West. The actual rail wars are over, but the six major railroad companies are still at each other's throats, using black magic, the undead, and everything in between to undercut each other's reach. Which is to say, there's more in this setting than you could ever get your arms around in the span of one or two or three or four campaigns. The railroad company conflict alone offers a whole bunch of western themed adventures that don't even have to connect to the overall reckoning and the primary meta story of the setting. The last 50 pages of the book are the bestiary, where you'll get several dozen generic NPCs and monster types, and maybe a hundred specific creatures like the automaton, which is powered by a zombie brain. I think this one is important in understanding the look and feel of Weird West as a genre, since this is the epitome of it. An evil company called Hellstrom Industries has built these machines and uses undead brains to power them in order to protect their assets all over the country. It's all so delightfully grotesque and pulpy. I love the best area in this book because it embraces specifically American and Native American folklore pretty comprehensively. And as far as why all these creatures would even exist all at the same time in one setting is explained in the canon. If you recall, the Reckoners are trying to recondition the world to be full of fear and in doing so in part by making everyone's worst nightmares come to life. So if the population at large believes in mythical creatures like a devil bat, then you might end up encountering a devil bat. And of course you'll also get classically gross monstrosities like a giant conjoined walking conglomeration of zombies. I think one thing that I would have loved to see more of in this long list of Weird West enemies is creatures drawn from Mexican history and lore. The reason being that Mexico and the United States were pretty intimately entangled in the 19th century, especially in the South and Southwestern regions of what is now the United States. Nevertheless, what you get in this book is a comprehensive Weird West package that is relentlessly on brand in terms of theme. I got a chance to play in a Deadland session, and I think my big takeaway wasn't anything about the setting or the meta story, what jumped out at me was how edges can stack up, even on a novice or starting level character. And when edges start stacking up, you really have to have GMs and players know the rules at least a little. I played a gunslinger with a quick start loadout of edges, and it ended up being a lot for me to juggle, just trying to shoot my pistols as many times as possible per turn. It was also the case that the huckster in our party, who has a ton of play options, also had some very long turns. I think as is the case with any RPG of medium complexity like this, where there are modifiers in extreme abundance and there's an emphasis on tactical combat, turn economy hinges on how well versed everyone at the table is with the rules. The Deadlands pawns come in a slim, very sturdy box and retails for $29.99. Inside you have a master list of each unit represented by 85 different illustrations. The pawns themselves are ultra thick, glossy, double-sided cardboard or chipboard, and there are a few pages of these. If you've ever bought a pack of pawns like this, you know that once you punch them all out, there's almost no going back. They usually just end up in a giant rattling pile inside the box unless you devise some sort of meticulous organization system for them. But yeah, these are nice pawns with a decent amount of redundancy where it matters and a few big creatures on the last couple pages. And here is Horror at Headstone Hill, a Deadlands adventure in a box keyed to the suede rule set, also retailing for $29.99. I think pawns can be pretty handy if you're running a physical game and you don't own a 3D printer, but this box is a pretty hefty value at $30. Here's the blurb on the back of the book that describes the scenario itself. And just as a warning, the rest of this segment contains spoilers because I'm going to leaf through the contents without hiding anything. This letter, written on the Tombstone Epitaph newspaper letterhead, is the adventure hook that players are supposed to read and which draws them into Wyoming territory to investigate a missing agent. It also mentions that the package in which the letter came also contains some newspaper clippings relevant to the investigation. Here's a picture of the dude himself. The paper feel and thickness varies depending on which artifact it is out of the box, which is pretty nice. The letter feels like thick quality letter paper, and this photo almost feels like photo paper. These newspaper clipping sheets feel relatively thin like newspaper. I will say though, this is a lot of reading to foist onto players. I can understand the desire to write all this stuff out as a designer, but the practicality of getting a whole table to read all this is pretty dubious. If you have really awesome players, maybe you can send them each a copy of this stuff before the session and have them all read it prior to the start of actual play. Here's a really authentic looking and feeling certificate of stock for 500 shares in the Wasatch Railroad Company. Really nice. And here's an authentic looking telegraph. Also included is a blank telegraph template so you can photocopy it and write up your own telegraphs for players. 
There's actually a section in the Deadlands book that details how telegraphs are unreliable because gremlins sometimes intercept and replace messages. So you could have some fun with that. These are notes from the missing agent who you're searching for, which are double-sided and you have to cut out. A glossy, decently sized map of the county in question is included, containing all the points of interest where your PC can get mutilated by monsters. And on the other side is a map of Heston Hills, where there are a ton of numbered locations. Twilight event cards are a handy way to randomly choose an event triggered in the story itself, and most of them have a D6 table for further randomization. The second little pack of cards contains four pre-generated archetypes, a couple of NPCs, and a number of monsters. This was interesting, a seven page booklet thing that is called the player's introduction. Again, it's loaded with text and I'm not sure how you're supposed to get the average table of players to read all this. If your players do read this much, hold on to them for dear life. The box also comes with a rounded D6 that has a gravestone for the six and acts as your little collectible wild die. Finally, there's the 120 page booklet that details the scenario itself. And it is quite thorough, describing the main town in the scenario, Heston Hill, three acts each with about three parts, and about 24 so-called savage tales, which are smaller scenarios that feed into a larger overarching story arc and which don't have to be played in order. So if you consider each savage tale as being one game session worth of play, this box set provides about 24 sessions, which again for $30 is pretty great entertainment value. And just overall, it's a lot of quality materials in the box. Handy if you're running a physical game. This whole scenario is also available digitally. All right, so here are my thoughts on Deadlands for Savage Worlds Adventure Edition. Quintessential Weird West. If there's one thing that this 200 page book does from the very beginning to the very end, it is encapsulate the genre of Wild West without dropping the ball even once. The creators didn't deviate from genre in virtually any way. I have yet to deeply explore other acclaimed Weird West RPGs like Malifaux, Weird Frontiers for Dungeon Crawl Classics, Fistful of Darkness, We Deal in Lead, and Frontier Scum, but Deadlands just seems to me the right amount of engagement with the genre. 200 full color pages with optional expansions and adventure supplements if and when you need them. The supplements. And those supplements are substantial. We only took a look at one in the video, Horror at Headstone Hill, but that's a hell of a box set with 24 smaller adventures centered around a town in Wyoming City. There's also Blood Drive, another adventure series that's set in Texas. And look, if we're being honest here, the supplements don't have to be keyed to the Adventure Edition in order for you to use it in your Adventure Edition game. If you're cool with a little bit of conversion work, there's a huge backlog of Deadland supplements going back to the 1990s when the setting first came out all of it written with a fairly consistent backstory in mind. Well, that's all I've got for now. I'd love to hear your experience with Deadlands if you've ever played it in any capacity, as well as if you'd like me to cover any other Weird West RPGs, either ones that I mentioned briefly at the end here or ones that I missed. I have links for everything down below, and if you'd like to keep this channel alive, please consider joining my Patreon. Thanks for watching. See ya.